I'm also putting it on the, our YouTube page as well, because this will be the training that uh, others watch this week. I'm also putting it on the, our YouTube page as well, because this will be the training that, well, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just record it because I think we're going to get feedback if we try that. Okay, so the, the video is being recorded. Thank you all for joining us for uh, uh, our, our training, which is titled Equity in, in Appalachia. Can everyone see the presentation? Okay, uh, we originally uh, did this training a couple weeks ago with the administrators, so uh, principals and, and other folks who are part of your equity teams. This is uh, pretty much what you saw two weeks ago. It might have been tweaked a little bit, and, and we've tried to condense it down into a one-hour training. But uh, what we want to do is really uh, just get a basic understanding throughout the school division for everyone of what we're trying to do around our work in equity and with uh, this group uh, that we're meeting with today, um, you all are part of your school's equity teams. So, you know, we would like for you all to be much more involved in the process and have a deeper understanding of what we're trying to do around equity. And that's okay, why you're participating right. today instead of uh, uh, next week, because on Monday we have a full day of equity training with uh, members of the equity collaborative. And if everyone could put their uh, uh, computer on mute, I'd appreciate it, please. Okay, so uh, to kick us off, you know, what is equity in schools? And equity is when student outcomes can't be predicted uh, based on any identifiable information. You know, the way things are in Pulaski County currently, we can predict the student's chance of graduating based on the elementary school that they attended. We can predict their uh, uh, chance of success on SOLs by their race or the income of their parents. All these things we can predict so we know we have not yet achieved equity. And we know we will have reached equity when none of we can't predict any outcomes based on any of the, the categories that, that we currently put students in for the, the purposes of, of collecting data. And what do we hope to accomplish with our equity work? We want every student to feel a sense of belonging in our schools. We want every student to experience success. And we want every student to have a positive educational experience. No matter what anybody says about all these things they believe equity are, this is what we are trying to achieve. We want our students to belong, we want them to succeed, and we want them to feel positive about their school experience. And we'll talk about why we want those two things a little more uh, later in the presentation. What our equity work does not include, it does not include critical race theory. Although there's been a lot of fear mongering in the community about CRT, there's not a CR, there's not a critical race theory curriculum in the works through the Virginia Department of Education or Pulaski County Public Schools. It is not to shame or, or seek apologies from students for being themselves. That has nothing to do with our equity work, but that's been cast in, in some of the the national media and, and some of the, the people who've been speaking at uh, board meetings, that, that's how they've been casting it, that we want people to feel ashamed for, for being who they are, for being born who they are. And, and that is certainly not what we want to do with uh, equity. We want, we want them to be proud of their individuality, but we also want them to be respectful of everyone else's individuality. And it's not a gotcha for employees. Uh, you know, Everyone's gonna be expected to follow whatever laws we're required to follow around equity but it's not an attempt to set traps or, uh, or, or create opposition to anyone's deeply held personal or religious beliefs. And, and why did we tackle uh, equity as Pulaski County Public Schools? You know, we knew that many, of group, many groups of our students were not having a successful or positive educational experience. And we know this because we have the data to support it. We have the discipline disparities, we have the achievement gaps, and more importantly, the students were telling us in, in conversations we were having with them, they were saying how bad the racism had gotten in our schools, uh, you know, especially in the secondary schools, that the use of the N-word and, and people were being bullied and, and uh, you know, harassed because of their skin tone or, or because of you know, their religious belief. I mean, it, it, we were hearing all these stories from students about how bad their experiences were. Uh, so we really felt like we had to do something to tackle it. 
and, and it just so happened that that at the same time we were trying to tackle it or figure out what to do, the Virginia General Assembly passed a number of equity related uh, requirements that that now make it legally. Uh, uh, now we are legally required to, to do things around equity and the things that are coming down that we we must address because of the acts of the General Assembly and 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 with the directives from the Department of Education. Uh, cultural competence training is going to be required for everyone with a professional license, and that will have to happen before the end of the current school year. Uh, there'll have to be a completion of class, a uh, completion of a class in African American history for anyone with a social studies teaching endorsement. Starting next year, teachers are going to be evaluated on cultural competence standards. It will be an additional standard to the seven that we already have. And school divisions are required to adopt policies for the treatment of transgender students prior to the start of the 21-22 school year, which Pulaski County did at their meeting on Tuesday night. And finally, uh, Virginia social studies standards are, uh, and that should say standards, not standardized, are being revised to incorporate a more accurate depiction of African American history. And we know uh, the, the administrators who've been going through training with the Equity Collaborative know that, that there are large chunks of American history that we are ignorant about because it has never been included in the social studies curriculum in Virginia or West Virginia or North Carolina, pretty much anywhere that was influenced by the, 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 the Daughters of the Confederacy uh, conference from 1910 that set social studies standards that have been in place for now for 110 years. A and even as the history changed and evolved, there were big chunks of it left out that were, are just amazing when you find out this was going on in the United States of America and sometimes in, within our lifetimes, and we've never heard about it. Um, the objectives today are at the end of this training and is our hope that participants will be able to describe connections between the decisions made by governments, businesses, and other institutions and the lack of career options for people in the Appalachian region of the country. Government will at times cater to the businesses and industry at the expense of the population. We know that whether you call it oppression or, or you call it whatever you like, you know, it has been a, a mark of U.S. history from the very beginning. And it's especially true in the area that we currently live in and many of us grew up in, the Appalachian region of the country, which is all of Southwest Virginia, all of West Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, Eastern Kentucky, Western North Carolina. All of that falls into the Central Appalachian region of the country. And we all share a lot of common history, no matter which state you're in, for how the, the government and industry exploited the population and, and, and you know, became extremely wealthy off of the natural resources without investing, uh, you know, really in the future of these regions. They only invested what they needed to extract the resources. And, and participants are going to be able to describe how a lack of opportunities in education or a negative experience with public schools can impact a family's attitude towards schools that transcends generations of students. And that's what we are working with right now. When we have parents who are difficult to, to reach, who seem to just come in with, with a bit of an attitude anytime you want to talk to them about their students, the chances are it was because they did not feel that they were treated fairly in school. They felt like they were discriminated against. They felt like they didn't have an adult they could trust and, and they didn't have a positive school experience and they project that onto their children. So it becomes generational, this cycle of people having negative attitudes about schooling, it, it becomes a cycle. And the only way we can break that is to work with the kids that we have now to make sure that they have a positive experience. So it is our hope at the end of this training that, that we'll at least have a basic understanding of those two concepts. And that will be what we build our equity work on because that is the those are the types of concepts that really impact what we do as much or more than anything else. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Mr. Ward, who will uh, put things kind of in a, a historical perspective. And uh, Dr. Sears, um, Troy Barkley's in the waiting room. Okay, Mr. Ward. I, I can't advance a slide. Okay. 
Um, we have a couple, uh, we've got a, an effective opener here. We have um, a little bit of a, a uh, quote here. So what I'd want you guys to do is read through this quote and then you guys can unmike and tell me what you, what you think about this quote. And you can feel free to put some things in the chat window as well. We can, um, we can do it that way too. All right, does anybody want to offer something up? Um, I think it goes back to what Dr. Sears said at the beginning when he said, we know we've reached equity when we can no longer predict outcomes based on these categories. So I think when, you know, we can consider ourselves successful when a child no longer looks at the categories that she's born into and puts herself in a box right out the gate. Um, Dr. McCarty, you put something in the chat box. You want to elaborate on what you put in there? Sure, Mr. Ward. Um, I, I think that kind of what this says is that our, as educators, our um, purpose, I guess, inspiration should be that every every child that we um, encounter, whether it be in the hallway, whether it be where, in the classroom or wherever, that our goal should be to make sure that they're get, getting the best education possible and the best experience in education possible. Okay, thank you. Do we have anyone else? Okay, we'll go ahead and, and move on for it. But we just wanted you guys to get thinking about that. Um, here's another one. Here's another effective opener. Let's look at this and see what you guys think about this one. So easy to do, Mr. Ward. <laughs> <laughs> so easy to do. It's it's like, uh, you know, uh, really having to make a conscious effort to say, well, we're going to make the we're going to get these kids to pass every uh, every test. Well, we got to do more than that. We got to help them uh, grow and thrive. OK, thank you. Mr. Ward, you now have control of the mouse. OK, thank you. Um, Rebecca, would you like to elaborate on what you put in the chat box? Yeah, the comment mentions about things living on the surface. It's too easy to make judgments about a group of people. But if you take the time to get to know an individual, you might be pleasantly surprised. Okay. Uh, Mr. Compton, you put something in the chat. Would you like to share? Mm -hmm. It's pretty self-explanatory. We have a tendency to look at someone based on maybe how they act or how they're dressed. And judge them without really knowing anything about their background okay who they are okay thank you anyone else okay so let's go ahead and talk about appalachia um, i won't give you guys a full geography lesson we all kind of have an idea but there's a couple of views of appalachia one of those is that it's a geography a geography uh, a situation where we have the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, they run from Maine, they run down into Alabama. So the mountains themselves are, are something that kind of defines us. We, we like our mountains. I think many of us, when we leave home and we go to where it's flat, um, we kind of feel a little disoriented because we don't have a hill or a mountain to know where to go. Uh, Pulaski County is going to be found in the center part of that. And um, 
Um, and, and so we have this area and you guys know that a lot of this area is going to be settled right after the American Revolution. And for the early part of our history, we were very much like other parts of the country. Um, at the time of the Civil War, things that would be happening uh, in Richmond weren't going to be too different than what was happening out here. It's going to be a farming based economy. Um, and eventually we're going to get through some industrialization that takes place. Now, it's at that point where things start to shift. It's, it's that point where the Appalachian region becomes different than other parts of the country. There's going to be a lot of industrialization and extractive industries in there. And when that happens, the position and the economics of, of the United States changes for Appalachia. And when you look at this from a historical perspective and an economic perspective, we see that the core areas are going to be the metropolitan areas um, that we see today. The big cities, those are going to be the place where a lot of those re natural resources go. It's going to be those areas where they're going to be taken from what we are is the periphery. And in that periphery, those things are taken out. Companies come in, get those resources, and they're shipped somewhere else. Or it's going to be a region um, that's going to do manufacturing. And then that manufacturing is going to ship those products to other places. When you're on the periphery, one of the issues that, it, that comes up is there's not a real lot of investment in that area. Companies don't invest their money in there. They invest their money elsewhere. They're trying to get the least amount of spending to get the most amount of resources from that. Um, and then we have those areas that are going to be fringe areas. And those fringe areas are going to be the shipping places. Um, today, I drove when I drove into work, I saw a coal train headed towards Norfolk, right? So Norfolk's going to be one of those periphery areas where coal shipped. And today, they're going to put it on boats and ship it all over the world. So when we get to this point, um, Appalachia is also going to be an economic area. Today we call this, uh, this is the counties that are served by the um, Appalachian Regional Commission. And there is funding from the federal government to help go against the poverty that's built up in this area. So one of the ways that things happen and, and a lot of the stereotypes that develop against people in Appalachia is because if you supported this industrialization, you are part of the main or the, the power broker. If you weren't, that's when the stereotypes developed. Stereotypes are a way to undermine um, the population. So what they say doesn't matter. So I'd like to ask you guys, you can uh, put it in the chat box or you could um, un, un, um, mute your microphones. Um, have you guys heard some stereotypes about the people of Appalachia? Lazy, don't want to work. Okay. Unintelligent. Okay. Backwards. Okay. Undereducated. What else? Okay. They were not, they were unintelligent. Anybody hear any jokes about not wearing shoes? Um, uh, one leg longer than the other. Um, don't know no better. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And those, those stereotypes develop. Um, and, and Brittany's right. Movies, uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, the real McCoys, um, we had uh, the, some of the new documentaries coming out on the History Channel. So I, I want folks to realize that those stereotypes develop and, and they're in our students as well. Uh, yeah, and there's Nancy, we marry our cousins, right? Um, uh, uh, Pillbillies, that's a new one that's coming out because of all the people that are addicted to Oxycontin. Um, we have the wild, wonderful whites of West Virginia that come out and so they expect all of us to be that way. Now, one of the things we'll talk about in a little bit is uh, fatalism. And it comes down to the point on how people define themselves. And the people from our region do that. There are kids in our school. Kids in our school feel differently about themselves and the kids that live in Radford. 
Um, and which is shocking to me because the only difference between Radford and Pulaski is a bridge. Um, but there is this perceived notion that they are less than. Um, in Appalachia, we have a, a cycle of poverty. And these are the things I'm going to address today. This economic uncertainty, housing instability. We're going to have some systemic factors like government policies and people's behavior and this notion of fatalism. All right, so the first industries that are gonna move in here are going to be extractive ones. We're gonna have the iron industry that comes in. They're gonna make pig iron. Um, they call it pig iron because they take the ore um, that they dug out of the ground around here, they melted it down. And when it poured out on the ground, it looked like pigs suckling on their mother. Okay, so this is dirty work, grimy work, hard work. Um, at the same time, we're going to have some coal mining here. Now we're not a historically um, bituminous coal mining area, but we do uh, have anthracite. So in the Parrot region, there's a type of coal, it was called house coal, it burns blue. This house coal is very hard um, and which made that type of mining especially dangerous. And there were several explosions at, at Parrot during the history of that area. Um, to get that coal out, they would use dynamite. Um, and, and I was just thinking about this the other day, we have people who harm themselves every 4th of July um, using dynamite underground in the dark. Uh, sometimes the mines were full of methane. Um, they would end up blowing themselves up or the roof would fall. So any number of things could happen. Um, and also those industries are short lived. Company com that comes in, they start extracting the industries. Extractive industries are notorious for having changing ownership. Um, and as soon as an area, those resources are, are used up, then they move away. One of the more troubling things about them from a historical perspective is that they didn't pay people in real money. The people lived in company towns. So there'd be a community that you would live in. The, the company would own your house. They would be the police force. They would be in charge of the school. They would be in charge of the church. And they also paid you in this script and script was what you paid folks and they could only be spent at the company store. So if you were someone who disagreed with the company, then you would um, lose your house, could be arrested. You couldn't go anywhere else because you didn't have any money. And you were basically at the will of these coal companies. And I've been reading some other things that this happened in, in towns around here. Uh, Furniture making in Bassett, that whole town was controlled by Bassett Furniture. You lived in a Bassett house, you went to a Bassett school, you went to um, the Bassett police force was there. Bassett had two churches that were run by the company. So you were basically at the will of that company. And as we'll talk about now, when that company failed, you were kind of left on your own. And the children that lived in these homes, their parents would go to work in the mines or in, in other areas when those parents would lose their job, then they would, um, they would be out of luck. Or instead of getting education, they would turn to going to the same situation that their parents are in. So this economic uncertainty, lack of choices, puts you in a position where you have few choices. And there's been a recent study, um, and that's the Dora Furnace, that's one that was here in Pulaski that, uh, that they finally tore down in 1938. Um, one of the implications of that is that you're also, when you're on the periphery, you're in competition with other areas. Um, and when you're in competition with those other areas, when it becomes cheaper to make things in other places, then you also lose to that competition. And those companies just leave you to your own. So the next thing uh, I'll talk to you about is the textile industry. It's gonna start in 1916. There's gonna be a whole lot of uh, these factories that open up. Um, some of the historic things I read, as you could tell, the women that worked in these industries because they would be hunched over from working at sewing machines all day long. Um, and many of the girls, their choices were once they got to just about high school age, they would go and work in the textile mills. And this is how, how damaging things outside of their control can happen. In 1988, Ronald Reagan vetoed a bill, and that bill was designed to help those textile factories. Two weeks after he signs that veto, a blue jean factory in Pulaski put 400 people out of work. 
And what's so remarkable about that is the people who worked in those factories really wanted to go to work. They really wanted to be part of that industry. Uh, one description uh, I, I read was a woman said that she would have crawled across broken glass to go into work. Um, after I gave this presentation the other day, somebody in the crowd came up to me and said, my mom worked at that factory and she was able to get a job at the bank. However, those people that worked in that company still met every year out at Clater Lake to have a reunion. It was like a death in the family. Those, those people were their family, the people they work with every day. They knew each other's children. And all of a sudden that, that had disappeared. So, and many of you are old enough to remember in the 90s where we started getting NAFTA and GATT, those textile factories started closing one after another. And if you, if you think about these, this in the furniture factory, many of our children have grown up at a time where it's been horrible economically for the county of Pulaski. They don't remember the times when there were 2,500 kids here at Pulaski County High School. They don't remember the time when downtown was full. They don't remember a time when, when their parents had good jobs. And we all know what happens when people lose their jobs is that they end up moving somewhere else. And I'm sure all of you could give numerous examples of people who moved elsewhere. Um, we, we see it when we have our homecoming game every year. We have people come back from the entire region. So with furniture, you can see the same kind of thing, right? 1950s, uh, Pulaski Furniture Company starts, takes up a huge portion of our downtown. Um, in the 90s, it was employing around 1,500 workers. Um, about the same time, they started importing furniture from other places around the world. You can still buy Pulaski Furniture, but we all know. We all know that that's not made in Pulaski anymore. We know that a lot of Bassett furniture is no longer made in Bassett, Virginia. We know that a lot of those textile mills aren't, aren't, aren't producing those goods that they once did. And the results of some of that stuff is the impact that it has on families. Um, we mentioned uh, the addiction to painkillers and alcoholism and drug addiction. All those are related to people who have no hope. And when you start losing hope, then you don't carry on and go forward. Education seems unimportant. Um, there is a study done by a gentleman, um, and if you're interested, I can get you his name, that shows that that stuff becomes generational and that builds to that cycle of poverty. Okay, um, I talked about these things here, so I'll move along. All right, a couple other things that happen. Um, housing practices. All of us, uh, or most of us probably own a home. We had to get a loan. The bank, uh, the process is kind of long and grueling, um, but that process is rigged against certain people. In, in 1933, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, they start doing research on communities. Um, some of you may have an FHA loan or another federally backed loans. That is the precursor to this. And one of the things that happened is they took communities of more than 40,000 people and they looked at areas and communities and they did these reports. And after they did these reports, they wanted to find out what the best areas were, the most desirable, uh, which ones were declining and which ones were hazardous. And this was also used, and we'll see this in a little bit, these were used until um, 1968 and 1974. So that is my lifetime, these practices were still in use. They, they were used to prevent African-American home ownership. It was it, it denied investment to certain areas. Uh, so if we look, here is, uh, here's a map of Roanoke and you see the green areas, we all know that green means go, those are good. But these red areas, these red areas here are ones that you should avoid. So if you look at the, 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 this map of Roanoke, most of Roanoke, the banks would say was a bad investment. All right, so here is one of these reports. And this one stings me a little bit because it, uh, the, the city that they're looking at is Salem. All right, and you can see Salem, the type of inhabitants right here were the best people. All right, one family, single family homes. You go down here, or there were no, at this time these were done during the Great Depression, uh, no foreign born, no Negro, nobody on relief. So that was seen as a good risk and the desirability was going up, okay? 
So if we go to another area, um, they're going to have, it's going to be the area called Northwest. You're going to see that it had white labor in there. But right here, you look at the infiltration of right here, it says less desirable whites. So this is not necessarily based on race, it's also socioeconomic status. So if they don't loan money to this area, those areas have a tendency to decrease. And studies today show that you take houses that were in the good areas, they're several hundred thousand dollars more valuable than these ones that were found in other neighborhoods. Um, and you can see here, this is going to be deemed hazardous. Um, here's uh, another example we have here. Um, you can see here's Roanoke. This is going to be the Williams Grove and Eastgate. There are some foreign born. There's going to be Negroes in there. Um, one of the one of the descriptions down here that says that on the barrier, there's going to be some Negroes on Day and Elm Street. So you can see that they are saying that that's declining. So if you are a bank, you're going to be prevented from purchasing in that area. Um, and the last one here is the old better families but there's an infiltration of less desirable tenant clients, right? The tenant class is moving in. So these are going to be used up until I was in elementary school. So it's not that long ago. So when they designed that, that system, hazardous, less desirable, they didn't re re receive any investment. And if you don't receive any investment, people can't buy them, they become tenant housing and the socioeconomic part of that status goes lower and lower. Um, we did a bus tour of the county and somebody described uh, we were looking around at some of the areas and they said, you know, once once you get that reputation of being a poor area, it's really hard to recover. And I had a couple of uh, folks on the bus that remembers Pulaski in the 90s. And at one time, Pulaski, downtown Pulaski was the place to live. But over time, I think some people would would think twice before moving into that community. Um, in 1974, they advocated the maintenance of harmonious neighborhoods. So that meant that they didn't want uh, people of color, um, certain people to move into areas. And these are all going to be run by realtors. And while some of these practices are going to be found illegal, when you're shopping for a house, you're at the mercy of a realtor taking you to a place saying this is where you should live. Um, just because things become illegal doesn't mean they stop happening. Um, in 1968, the year I was born, all of those things were prohibited. Um, so now if you look at newspapers, I don't know if anybody still tries to find housing in a newspaper, but you'll see that little symbol right there. And that symbol says that if you are going to use that, um, you can't discriminate based on these things. Now, a lot of things are legal and practice, sometimes that ends up being a little different. Now today in 1977, Banks are required to record that information. And if you filled out a, a mortgage application or anything like that, you see that they ask you those questions. It's another move to try to keep them um, from being accountable. All right. All right, so let's talk about so some, some systemic things here. Here are a couple court cases. You see that couple at the top on the left, um, that, that is the, the Jones family. Uh, Mr. Jones was a veteran, tried to buy a home, and he was denied. The Supreme Court ruled that that housing was unconstitutional. That's the year I was born. Loving v. Virginia, up until 1967, Virginia had a law that said interracial couples could not marry. So that's about kids that are about my age. So we're not talking about the distant past. I know some folks like to believe that some of those things happened in the past and they don't um, happen anymore, but those things continue to take place um, long after we think about um, marches and civil rights movement. Um, here's another one I came across. This is down in Wildwood Park in Radford. Some of you may know it. Um, this, this sign kind of bothers me. Uh, and it, actually, when I took this picture, there was a lady walking across the trail. She walked over. She said, you know why it closed in 1964? And I said, yes, I do. Um, and it was because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. She said the same thing happened in Bluefield, where she was from. And if you go around our region, you'll see that a lot of the swim clubs that we have all got started in 1964. They were private clubs, so they could pe prevent people from coming in. They're not in the public. And if you look at that image, you see a nice uh, white family there at the swimming pool. So in Radford, they were more willing. 
they were more willing to fill in the swimming pool and deny everybody access than desegregate their swimming pools. And even more, even more remarkable, if we think about Virginia, um, the, the Brown versus Board of Education um, Supreme Court ruling was 1954. Pulaski County High School does not fully integrate until 1966. So we're talking uh, 12 years there, and that's the year that my sister was born. So we're talking we're, we're talking one lifetime that these things, and, and as we said, just because they were desegregated, people didn't wake up the next day and say, everything's rosy. Um, and, and the last one of these, and I'll be very quick, because I know that um, Tanya is going to talk about these too. The idea of fatalism, it's a concept that describes people in Appalachia very well. Um, when you face economic uncertainty, housing instability, and discrimination, you tend to build that into your self-image. If you have, if you're not doing well, you know, the biggest barriers we place on ourselves, and we end up defining ourselves as somebody who doesn't have, um, they're not capable of something, they're unintelligent, they're not good. You guys went through those things that were uneducated, where we're, we're, um, we don't know any better. Those kind of things become part of a person's identity. And when that becomes part of their identity, that gets passed on to the next generation. Um, and this is a, a quote that I came across that I like. Poverty is a circumstance, not an identity. And one of the things we have to do as educators is get beyond children seeing themselves, um, their identity as being someone poor. Um, and she'll talk about that. All right, I put this one up there because I know some of the stuff I said was pretty heavy, but this is a picture of my granddaughter. This is Addison. And my daughter put this on, on Instagram um, after she came out of the yarn store. And my granddaughter really loves uh, trucks and uh, she likes an excavator. That's her favorite piece of equipment. And she was just oh so excited. Um, there's also a video, I won't burden you with that but she was dancing around and very excited about the excavator. And a woman came out of the store and looked at her and said, um, oh, sweetie, trucks are for boys. And Addison turns to her and said, no, that's an excavator, that's for dirt. And if you think about, um, she has no idea how profound her words are, but if you think about a little girl who's three years old and you already, they're, they're, somebody's already telling them what they're going to be or who they are. Um, that's where we get to a point where things need to change. And I hope uh, this helps you guys out to see how we got there. And I will now turn this over to Tanya. All right, thank you, Brian. And Dr. Sears, are you able to give me uh, rain on the slides there? Okay, the first one. Um, Mr. Ward has just shared with us some historical practices that took place around Pulaski County and other local um, communities. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about how generational issues can affect our students. Um, in the chat box, I'd like for you to take a few minutes and give your thought on the following question. How could a lack of opportunities in education or a negative experience with public schools impact a family's attitude that transcends generations? And if you'll just take a couple minutes and um, put your ideas there or you feel free to speak out, either one's fine. Ms. Singleton, for some reason, it is not allowing me to transfer it over to you. So I will click until your name pops up and I can transfer it over. Okay, that's fine. Um, anyone want to put something there in the chat box? What are some things you think of when we talk about a lack of opportunities? Okay, looks like Dr. McCarty. Oh, there's a lot there. 
going on now creates a preconceived notion of how things are. Um, Ms. Miano, if parents feel disengaged and discriminated, they pass this to their children. Um, why don't you talk about calling parents for just a second? Yes, ma'am. Am I live? I can't find me. Yes. Yes. Well, often when we're talking to students, parents, and maybe the students having a difficult time or is not enjoying school or, or is feeling lost, whatever, the parents tell us how awful their experience was. They don't trust us. They um, generally say they would expect their child to act that way because they were treated so horrible when they were here. It's really tough to try to bring them into the present. But this happens an awful lot that we're trying to actually help the parents understand that maybe things are different now because they had such negative experiences when they went to school, according to their perceptions. Absolutely. Thank you. Anyone else want to, I see several comments there. Anyone else want to speak to that? Brittany, do you want to share? Sure. Um, actually, when I came into teaching, I had to kind of reset my own mindset because it was almost the opposite for me. I grew up with parents who weren't involved, who didn't care about my schooling, like they could have cared less. And so coming in as a new teacher, I assumed that all the parents of my students had that same mindset, like school wasn't a priority. And I kind of had to tweak that. And the reason I came in with such a strong belief system was because it was what I lived. And so on the flip side, for those who go through an education system that doesn't meet their needs, or if they go through feeling like, you know, um, teachers and things aren't looking out for them, don't have their best interests at heart, then they're going to automatically assume in the future that all teachers are like that and that their children are going to have the same experiences. And it's a, it's a learning curve. Um, we have to work to build that community with parents and families to build those relationships so that they can see, you know, one, we're not, we're not all that way. Um, and that our individual experiences do not have to paint you know, the picture for everyone else. Absolutely. And I think you just um, touched on several points that we'll talk in the, um, in the slides moving forward. So um, I see lots of great responses in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead, Dr. Sears, if you can shift one slide, that would be great. Okay, I've made you the host. It oh, okay. Let's see. Mine is still not advancing. Thank you. Um, so if we break that question that we were just asked um, down into smaller pieces, we talk about a lack of opportunities and what that might look, look like for our students. Um, there can be several ways that we see a lack of opportunities. It may be with a lack of parent support, um, possibly due to their own experiences with public education, um, a lack of exposure or awareness of real life experiences. And I just read an article the other day that talked about students coming back to school. Um, teachers were so excited, students are so excited. Um, and the teacher gave a writing um, prompt, write about something fun you did over the summer. And not all of our students did fun things over the summer. Um, sometimes summers are not pleasant. Sometimes weekends are not pleasant. Sometimes um, holiday breaks are not pleasant for our students. They're not um, getting those same real life experiences that others may be having. Um, our students may have a lack of advocates or support systems looking out for them and helping guide them through the educational process. They may have a lack of opportunities based solely on where they live um, and what resources are close by. When we um, had to do virtual learning, so many of our students didn't even have internet um, to get on Canvas. So we have to consider what is what they have um, that they can rely on. 
um, our students may have may be faced with a lack of high expectations in our schools. They may be faced with a lack of well-resourced schools. And we can think about how different schools in our counties compare or in our county compare. Um, a lack of diverse teaching and leadership staff, lack of class choices um, for the upper grades and lack of prospects after graduation. So all of those things come into play and affect the experiences that our students have in our schools. And what this may look like in the school setting. So you have a student who faces some of those things that we just talked about. Um, they may come to school disorganized. They may not return things to school. The things they do return may be um, partially completed or not completed at all. Our students may show a lack of self-motivation or difficulty getting started um, with assignments. They may show a strong dislike of authority and their effort in our classroom may be based on their feelings for their teachers. Now, when I look at that list um, as, an as an administrator, excuse me, um, I see a student that's going to be referred for either core or a student that's going to be referred for a discipline issue. So if there is a way that we can be proactive in meeting their needs, um, we need to consider that. All right. So when those students come to us and we talked about they have a lack of um, lack of opportunities and um, what they may look like in our classroom. Oh, there you go. Um, the things that they may be facing in our public schools, and we know this because our data has, has told us for years, students in minority and low income groups are gonna perform lower in the standardized testing. Students in those same groups are gonna have higher incidences of suspension and discipline referrals. Those same students are gonna have higher dropout rates than that of their peers. And we may not see those students um, being represented in honors classes or gifted programs or honors programs that our schools are offering. They're gonna be underrepresented in those and the students and families in these groups are going to have difficulty navigating the educational system or obtaining what they need to be successful. Um, one second before you change the slide there. Um, let's see. No, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So when we talk about the attitudes in public education, um, I think Mr. Ward mentioned that our parents um, sometimes seem upset when they come in and these are because of their bad experiences in public education. So we talked about education was just something that the students did. They weren't ever given the reasons, uh, the why behind the education. What was the benefit of getting a good education. Um, Mr. Ward also talked on um, fatalism and fatalism was the idea that um, it was inevitable. It was just what it was. And a lot of times we hear our, our families come in with the attitude of, if it was good enough for me, then it's good enough for you. I turned out okay and we'll just keep moving forward. Um, a lot of times our students go home and education is not the focus. Uh, the problems at home or the problems in the community or the problems that their families are facing, um, those are the things that become important when the student arrives at home. There's very little communication about education and so it doesn't always seem as important to the student. And then there's some more about the attitudes there on the next slide. Um, education often gets 
left out of long-term plans and goals. So the students, uh, the families know what the end result is, but there's not a structured plan or, or goals, short-term goals to meet that plan. Um, students weren't taught what they could do with the education. Um, again, they know what, what the end result is, but they weren't taught what they could do and the benefit of that education. Students acted out or became disengaged because they thought that their teachers didn't care. So it's important for us to build those strong relationships with our students. And we have to make school relevant for every student that's here. All right, this next one um, was a quote that I came across, let's see. And it illustrates the importance of a strong relationship with our students, no matter what they're bringing to the table. Um, emotional response dictates the student behavior and eventually um, supports their achievement. All right. On this one, I would like for you to um, type in the chat box or you're welcome to speak out on it. Um, when we're sharing information with our families, what are some ways that we can let them know um, that we have high expectations for all children? What are some ways that we can share that? Um, what methods of communication do we find most effective for reaching those families? And how can we practice meaningful engagement with parents and communities? So if you... Um, want to answer those questions on the chat box, that would be great. Ms. Singleton? Yes. One of the things that we did several years ago when we uh, kind of created the instructional model uh -huh. is we wanted to put it in, in what we called uh, grandparent friendly language or grandparent centric yeah. language. Uh, we are really understanding that a lot of folks are not familiar with uh, the language of education or the terminology of education. Mm -hmm. So that's why when we did that, we, we made those um, definitions and the whole concept in grand, grandparent-centric or grandparent-friendly um, language. And, and that was a good way to kind of really begin the conversation of reaching out to, to folks in the county. And Dr. McCarty, I love that idea, especially considering um, here at Kreiser, we have such a large um, population of students who are being raised by grandparents or other um, family members. And I think we're seeing that all throughout the county. That's, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Welcome. Hey, I was going to share that, that question, what are some ways we can share information with families about the importance of high, holding high expectations for their children? Mm -hmm. I think also as part of this process, we need to examine ourselves and make sure that we are holding high expectations for our students. Because we mentioned some of the, um, you know, topics, well, some of the stereotypes at the beginning of this presentation. And we have to make sure that we don't hold any of those kind of stereotypes in our own minds, biases with students that come into our classroom or make prejudgments because that does affect what we're going to expect from our students. So if we're going to ask the parents to do that, we also need to make sure that we examine ourselves and make sure we're not setting different expectations for different groups in our own classrooms. Excellent, Rebecca. And um, here in the next slide, we're going to touch on bias. So thank you for bringing that up. Anyone else? Some meaningful engagement with parents and communities. Anyone want to speak to that? Yeah, I would say start out with what you see in her, like what you see in her kid. Like, uh, for example, like, <clears throat> uh, how can I say this correctly? Um, like where, where I see their kid going, I guess, because you got to get a buy-in from, you got to get a buy-in from the parent first. The only way you can get a real true buy-in is if you know they're, you're truly invested in their kid's future. Like, so I always like to start out with something like that when I call a parent, like what I, because it lets, lets them know I'm commun communicating with their kid and I'm actually care about their kids. I care about their future because there's always a there's already a huge distrust between the parents and the school, especially being a black and brown student. I know my experiences from from Plas County school system. There's a huge distrust between 
that community and the school system. So the moment you, you, you contact the parent, the first thing you're discussing is where you see their kid and, and their future. And unless not, you really care and you have a buy into their kid's future and you truly care about the kids. Does that make sense what I'm saying? I'm going with that. Absolutely, yes. Thank you for sharing. And parents are savvy enough to pick up on that. So just to pick back with Mr. Hodge said, parents are savvy enough to pick up on whether or not they think you care about their child. Absolutely. Anyone else want to speak to that? Let's see. Um, Ms. Dillon, take the time to make a personal contact. Um, too often, the one can be read into an email, which puts off families and creates hostility and trust issues. Absolutely. Um, I think trust is such a big part of that, and several of you have, have touched on um, the parent buy-in and trusting us uh, to move their children forward, absolutely. Ashley, um, would you like to uh, comment on yours there? Um, sure, I've just noticed that whenever I set high expectations for my students, it's kind of like an attitude change, mm -hmm. especially those that aren't very confident in their abilities and they're kind of afraid to come out of their shell and show what they know. When you hold them to those high expectations and you tell them, you know, I know you can do this, then a lot of the times you see them soar. And the parents can feel that too. Absolutely. I hear someone else. Um, I don't know if that's um, feedback there or if someone else had something they wanted to share before we move on. Okay, we'll go ahead. Um, Ms. Smith talked about addressing personal biases. Um, Dr. Sears, can you go back one, I believe? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, um, when we're addressing personal biases in the classroom, there's three good questions we can ask ourselves as educators. Do we truly believe that regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic background, all those factors, do we truly believe that everyone um, is capable of being academically successful? And do we have beliefs about their home lives or their community that prevents them from, excuse me, prevents us from seeing their academic potential? And uh, the last one there, that's probably my favorite. Do I treat students the way I want my own children treated? And I think Mr. Hodge, you touched on that too. Um, you know, what do we want for our own children when we send them to school? And hopefully that's what we're giving um, every student that walks through our door. All right. Hey, Tanya. Yes. I thought I'd just share one quick experience. And I grew up in Newport News. They didn't integrate to 1970. So they were a little behind Pulaski. Pulaski was a little more progressive, which wow. is great. Um, and which is interesting because, you know, the black population where I come from was much larger, but um, they took a little more time integrating. But I only can remember one teacher in all of my experience that I would say to this day definitely was racist but not only racist, classist. You know, you talked about the distance socioeconomic. She definitely treated different groups in her classroom. Um, if you were black and you lived uptown, she treated you one way. If you were black, you lived downtown, she another way. If you were white, she treated you a different way. I mean, it was so obvious. Doesn't happen all the time, um, but hers was pretty blatant and open. The others, if they had that feeling, I never knew it because they always treated us, you know, um, you know, like they did have expectations. So even if you do have your inner biases, you know, go against the grain or I would encourage everybody to go against the grain. She's one that did it, but, and it does happen. And it still unfortunately happens today. I will even say some of our coaches may realize athletes sometimes get a bad rap too. And, um, you know, they have folks like you're only in school because you want to play this or you want to do the sport and not um, buying into the idea that, yes, yeah, sometimes athletes do want to excel in school also. So sometimes we just group kids and make assumptions by groups. You know, they're not your typical um, race or socioeconomic, but other, other factions or groups in the schools that we might have biases about. 
Absolutely. And Ms. Smith, I would ask, do you think um, when the teacher treated different groups that way, do you feel like the kid, the students um, um, kind of worked towards that, like a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of, or did they rise above or what, what was the experience there? What was sad for me is actually I tried to please her. Oh. Um, I'll give you an example. She lost something in the classroom one day. I found it on her desk and another student who was white pointed it out. She hugged him and then he said, she's the one that found it. She didn't hug me, oh. you know, so um, yeah. And every, and even on picture day, she gave advice on how we should dress for picture day the next day. Mm -hmm. I dressed exactly as she suggested. So I kept trying to please my teacher, even though, because, you know, when you're a kid, that's what you're supposed to do. At least I was raised, you're supposed to, you know, respect the adults and their opinion. So even with efforts, I mean, she embarrassed kids in the classroom. She, she was just not a nice person. Um, yeah. She told a little girl who had on new clothes that if you're going to wear new clothes, you should change your underwear. I mean, in front of the whole class, you know, just things like that. But I've only had that one experience, but that does happen. And you may not be the teacher, but you may encounter who's a student who had a teacher like that previously. Mm -hmm. And you might have, or a parent that had the experience. So you might have to I, I kind of help undo some damage when they, yeah. they get to you. Um, so we just have to be aware that some folks may have had prior bad experiences that we may have to help mend. Overcome them, absolutely. And it looks like uh, Dr. McCarty responded there too in the chat. So um, he says it's almost as though folks make an effort to convince themselves that their bias practices are not biased, but perfectly normal. Absolutely. And on this slide, um, some ways that we can eliminate bias in the classroom. We all have biases, um, but we have to be honest with ourselves and know what those biases are um, going in. Show that we care and build relationships. Like Ms. Smith said, we may have to overcome some previous relationship barriers. Um, find ways to highlight all student strengths because all students do have strengths and strengths that um, they can share in a classroom community. Uh, we need to avoid judging parents and students too quickly. Um, and remember, we're working as a team, not tolerate any type of racism in our classrooms, um, maintain those high expectations, build those relationships, um, help our students know why and how they're being tested and the importance of that and the benefits of that. And even treating our most challenging students as star students. And hopefully, um, this is what I was touching on Ms. Smith, hopefully watching them rise um, to what we're calling them to. Mrs. Singleton, this is Elizabeth yes. Webb. Um, you know, when I think about biases and, and conversations about biases, there is definitely a level of vulnerability that we ask people to have when having those discussions. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, is going to, to be difficult for some folks to allow themselves to, to feel. Um, because when we're really taking an inward look and we're looking at biases that we may have, I mean, that you know, for us, you know, it may not be as uncomfortable as it is for some of our other teachers or community members. And, and how can we help them step into that vulnerable place mm -hmm. where they are reflecting on things they may not be doing as well as they could be or would like to be even. And, and so I think that's a, a hurdle that part of the discussion, you know, will have to help folks get past. Great comment, Elizabeth. Um, addressing our own biases is difficult and it, it hurts a little bit, um, especially when you recognize things that you might, uh, like uh, I believe it was Dr. McCarty said, you might have thought it was normal, but when you really look at it, um, we start to see how those, those ideas um, shape and mold our instruction and um, our feelings for our students. And good point there. The last slide I have here is um, 
kind of an open chat, what are some biases that you might have? And if you're open to sharing those, or you may have heard from your teaching colleagues that might stifle a student's educational success. And if anybody wants to speak to that, feel free to, um, to speak out or type it in the chat box. Again, some of those things are, are sensitive to us and we're learning to overcome some of those. Um, but if you'd like to speak out, feel free. Not all at once though. That could be an exit ticket if we wanted to there. Well, and just with my thought process a little bit, you know, what I, what I see as an administrator uh -huh. um, is more along the lines of um, biases towards students who might have behaviors that aren't typical of your white middle class backgrounds that um, many of folks in, in education or just even middle-class backgrounds um, experience, you know, and they ask for having their needs met in ways that aren't mm -hmm. um, the most easy to, to deal with. And, and as an administrator, I see a lot more of that. Um, you know, how do we deal with those students in our school and in our classrooms? Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that one. Um, it looks like Ms. Card has one. Um, Dana, would you like to elaborate on that? Not necessarily at this point, but I, I thought that that needed to be spoken or, or written, um, but that is an additional bias that we've encountered. Um, okay, against language um, in addition. Language and country of origin and why someone may be here and uh -huh. and, and things that once they're here with us, they're here and there are students. Um, mm -hmm. Those things have come up. Thank you. Good. Um, Joni, would you like to share? Well, I've actually talked to teachers that have this attitude that um, we are um, spending so much effort on reaching the, the typical, you know, the groups that are, are um, not performing as well and just um, assuming that the, the kids that, you know, have the supportive families and um, typically do well are going to continue that way and, and uh, that they feel ignored. I mean, I've actually heard other teachers say that before. So that, that I think is a problem. Absolutely, thank you for sharing. Um, I know earlier, um, Mr. Ward talked about some biases that we have toward or others have toward uh, people in Appalachia. So there are a lot out there. Um, looks like Ms. A. Lineberry, we may assume a student is a particular way because of their older siblings. Absolutely. Um, that's a bias that I think we see in education a lot. So, um, at this point, I will turn it back over to Dr. Sears. I appreciate your attention. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ward and Ms. Singleton and for everyone for participating and, and all the, the really good comments. And, and, you know, I feel really good about going into the training on Monday because it's obvious that, that you all have been thinking about this and what it means and the different concepts and how it affects education. And, and, and I think that, you know, we have a good group at each school to, to help lead that school in addressing the issues of inequity and, and helping, you know, work toward the, the school division's mission of, you know, trying to create a, a, an educational environment where all students and all parents feel respected, no matter what, uh, you know, they bring to the table, no matter what they bring into the school day, that they feel like they're going to be treated with respect and that they're going to get, uh, you know, value out of the educational experience. And, and that's what we're hoping to achieve. So, uh, Thank you all for participating. I look forward to working with you some more on Monday. And, and this uh, uh, training that with your comments will be what is shown to the 
the rest of the division when, when they when they log on Monday to do their virtual training. So thank you for being part of that as well. I, I hope that you uh, have a good day and look forward to seeing everyone at the barbecue at uh, Pulaski County Middle School here in a couple of hours. Uh, thank you all. Thank you. We'll try to save y'all some food. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, Rebecca. I know where you live. I'll show up and just take it from you. Oh, yeah. 